You're listening to the Hey Legal Podcast. CPD, when you want, where, where, where you want. CPD for Modern Lawyers. This free Hey Legal Podcast is brought to you with the support of Caseload from De Novo Business Intelligence. Hi and welcome back to the Hey Legal Podcast. Coming up in this week's episode, we have Molly McGrady, Solicitor at the Employment and Pensions Unit at Anderson Strathairn. Molly's in conversation with two of her colleagues, Robin Turnbull and Jenna Forrest, also solicitors at the Employment and Pensions Unit. Throughout this episode, we will discuss the new furlough leave and job retention scheme recently announced by the government last week. We find out what exactly furlough leave is and who it applies to. HMRC is said to reimburse employers for 80% of wage costs up to a cap of £2,500 a month. We then discuss the job retention scheme and the changes to statutory sick pay. Um, This would mean those employees who do not get onto furlough leave might still be entitled to statutory sick pay if, for example, they have certain caring responsibilities. Also, there's a lot of good information which relates to employers throughout the show. And lots of employers are wondering how they go about selecting people for furlough leave. That's a really difficult thing for employers to face. A podcast that will relate to many, so let's jump into the show. Hello and welcome to our podcast. My name is Molly McGrady and I'm a solicitor in the Employment and Pensions Unit at Anderson Strathairn. We've teamed up with Hay Legal to provide some quick guidance on furlough leave and the job retention scheme, which were announced by the government last week in response to the coronavirus crisis. I should point out that we're recording this on the 25th of March 2020, and the full details of the scheme are yet to be announced. But the existing principles of employment law give us a good idea about how employers can make use of furlough leave and how it's likely to work in practice. So whilst the announcement came as a great relief to many employers and employees, it's also created lots of questions and uncertainty. So we'll be doing our best to bring some clarity and answer those questions uh, using what we know so far about the scheme. So I'm joined today by my colleagues, Robin Turnbull and Gemma Forrest, who are both solicitors in our employment team. Uh, But when I say joined, uh, of course, We're not sitting together as we would be at work. Um, We're actually recording this remotely. So if we now turn to uh, the the topic of today's podcast, furlough leave and the job retention scheme. Um, So furlough leave, is that something that we've heard of before or is this a new concept in employment law? (laughs) It's definitely a new concept. It's a brand new concept. Um, And it's, it's also known as the coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, And in a nutshell, it means all UK employers will be able to access support from the government to continue paying part of their employees' salary for those employees that would otherwise have been laid off during this crisis. To access the scheme, employers need to designate affected employees as furloughed workers and will need to agree this with their employees. And uh, I know we're still waiting on a lot of details for the scheme coming out, um, but do we know how much people can be paid under this scheme? So at the moment, HMRC is said to reimburse employers for 80% of furloughed workers' wage costs up to a cap of uh, £2,500 a month. Um, HMRC are currently working urgently uh, to set up a system, system for that reimbursement. And we are currently assuming that the 80% is of £3,125, but are awaiting clarification as there is a possibility it will be 80% of the cap at £2,500. Yeah, and some of the terminology that's been used seems to have created a bit of confusion as well, uh, because the government said laid off. Um, Now, as we know, lay off in employment law Um, means that the employer is providing employees with no work and no pay for a period of time whilst retaining them as employees. Um, But do we think they're using layoff in this way or layoff as in made redundant? It's pretty unclear. Um, It's possible the words laid off could mean made redundant um, rather than laid off or layoff in the legal sense of the word. In other words, being sent home without pay. 
if that's correct, that might require employers to undertake a redundancy selection exercise and then having identified those who would have been made redundant, obtain their agreement. But what do we think would happen um, if HMRC did not accept that the, empl- that the, the employee would have been dismissed? Um, and what if um, the employer has already given a commitment that it won't make dismissals? Um, I suspect there will be little political appetite or capability for HMRC to scrutinise every single application under the scheme. I imagine there will be a huge number of applications, so HMRC may be overwhelmed. Um, But reading the guidance um, that's available so far, it seems that furlough leave is to be used as an alternative to redundancy. I mean, it's it's called the the job retention scheme, And it appears that the idea is to help retain the jobs of those who would otherwise have been made redundant rather than laid off in the legal sense of the phrase. So basically, employers might need to be careful rather than going gung-ho, thinking that it will be reimbursed for anyone they choose. And that's precisely why we recommend taking legal advice and using our carefully worded letter. And do we know who could be eligible under this scheme yet? So at the moment, the guidance is that the scheme will apply in respect of all employees on PAYE, so including those zero hours contracts. So this means it will cover many workers as well as employees. But the job retention scheme does not currently apply to self-employed people or contractors. However, we are looking and expecting some further guidance and support from the government in respect of these individuals. Yeah, it seems like that guidance might be coming out soon, um, which should hopefully uh, provide some clarity on that. Um, But what about those uh, workers or employees who've got variable hours, or what about those who are on zero hours contracts? So it's not currently clear what wage costs HMRC will take into account when determining the level of reimbursement that can be claimed. It will be particularly difficult to identify what 80% of wages are for zero hours employees whose wages obviously fluctuate. Uh, The employer will need to have clarity on this point before it agrees furlough leave um, with the worker because they are agreeing to a contractual variation in terms of payment and will want to ensure that they do not commit to payment in excess of what may be recovered from HMRC. Some employers may take the view that those casual or zero hours workers and employees who are not guaranteed work from the employer do not need to be put on furlough leave at all because the employer can simply refrain from offering them that work. This approach is not really in the spirit of the scheme, which intends to ensure that employees and workers retain a basic income during the crisis stages of the pandemic. And do we know yet whether a furlough leave is going to be voluntary or employers can force employees to take it? This seems to be um, something that there's um, a bit of uncertainty about. Yeah, very very good question, Molly. Um, furlough leave must be voluntary. And so it's important to recognise that an employer doesn't put an employee on furlough leave. Rather, it is agreed with an employee that they go on the furlough leave. Um, But the law recognises that there is an imbalance of power between the employer and the employee. So there's a question of when is something voluntary? If an employee faces the choice between redundancy or furlough leave, can it be said to be voluntary? Um, I imagine the reality, though, is that very few employees would, having been put on furlough leave, um, seek to argue that it was forced upon them and that the pay applicable doesn't apply. It doesn't seem to be in most employees' interests to do that. Um, But what if you got uh, an employee who was insisting or demanding to be on furlough leave? Yeah, of course, um, that that might happen. There there might be some employees who try to do that. Um, But an employee does not have a unilateral right to be furloughed. Um, Some may try to force the issue, but they do not have a right to be furloughed. I mean, it's, it seems that this uh, scheme has brought some uh, reassurance for employers, but a lot of employers um, are wondering, sort of like practically, practically speaking, you know, what should they be doing? And um, it's probably a good idea for employers to be ensuring that they are documenting any of the formal leave discussions. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, employers should make sure that the conversations around this are written down, um, including where the conversations are held on the telephone, which these days most will be. Um, and that's really in order to show that their employees have been made aware of the risks of refusal rather than being given some sort of ultimatum. It's worth mentioning that it's possible that some employees could record the conversations, so employers should bear that in mind. That's right. We are making use of that technology right now, so uh, you never know. Uh, employees could be the same uh, recording things. Um, and lots of employers are wondering how they go about selecting people for furlough leave. That's a really difficult um, thing for employers to face. Yeah, Molly, so that is a very tricky area. It's not going to be easy to select those for furlough leave. Uh, it is possible that some employees, including those with children, might want to take furlough leave, particularly where they would ultimately lose 20% of their pay. Equally, those with caring responsibilities might want to take furlough leave. Uh, in such situation, an employer may, may need to select one over the other. Um, issues could arise in relation to that for indirect sex discrimination um, or indirect age discrimination. So employers need to be alert to the, the possible discrimination risks. Yeah, it's a tricky situation, but does it look like employees might be able to sort of share furlough leave if there's any dispute over who's going to go on furlough leave? So that would be, for example, where an employee um, takes two days a week um, of furlough leave and another employee takes another um, two days. It appears, though, that sharing furlough leave will not be possible because an employee cannot perform any work for the employer when they're in the scheme. What if an employer wanted to sort of rotate the, employ the employees who were on furlough leave? Um, so, for example, having employees take it one month at a time so this is one aspect of the scheme that is currently unclear, but we are hoping to see some clarity on that from the government. Recently had uh, changes made to statutory sick pay due to the coronavirus crisis. Um, do we think that the, um, the job retention scheme is going to make any further changes to SSP? Mm, there, there's nothing so far to suggest that the new rules on statutory sick pay will be affected. Um, so this would mean those employees who do not get onto furlough leave might still be entitled to statutory sick pay if, for example, they have certain caring responsibilities. Those employers who cannot recoup statutory sick pay because they have more than 250 employees should bear that in mind when deciding requests for furlough leave. And another point that relates to this is that employers will be alive to the potential for discrimination claims when deciding whether or not to suggest furlough leave. And all sorts of considerations apply here because furlough pay will, for most, exceed statutory sick pay. I mean, the, the reality is that lots of employers have already made redundancies as a result of the situation, um, you know, and, and before um, the job retention scheme was announced. Um, that's been, there's been, you know, lots of that reported in the press, some high profile ones. Um, those empl some empl employers who have already made redundancies might be wondering if they can reinstate those employees or perhaps take on new ones. Yeah, to totally. Um, there are circumstances in which employers can reinstate uh, and the prior dismissal is removed, um, but prompt action may be required. So, for instance, where an employee is reinstated following an appeal against dismissal. Um, but unfortunately for some employers, it's simply not possible to wait or, or take up this option. Cash flow issues mean that some employers will need to move to temporary pay cuts, pay delays um, or reduced hours and are better placed to help employees to agree to this. Um, and regardless of what option is taken, process and consultation may be important, even where timescales time are tight. And um, what about how the furlough payments will actually be made? Will they be made to the employer or to the employee? So the payments will be made to the employer to then make to the employees and the, they will seek reimbursement of that payment from HMRC. Yeah, and this has, of course, brought a lot of reassurance and relief 
uh, to some people, but really it's not going to eradicate the fear of redundancies um, for either employees or employers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Crucially for many businesses and their employees, the scheme might just send this issue further down the road. The scheme may allow employers to plan and consult and for employees to prepare as best as possible for what might occur in the future. Even after current restrictions are lifted and furlough leave comes to an end, few businesses will be able to return to normality immediately. And many employers, understandably, may not wish to operate on the hope or assumption that they will. Yeah, and something that a a lot of employers are wondering about is whether they can consult with employees about redundancy when they're on furlough leave. Um, some employers are wondering um, if, the, if it's a case, if the case is that they're not able to have any contact with the employee because the employee is not able to do any work whilst on furlough leave. Um, do, do we know anything further about that? So it's thought that the consultation with employees and obviously depending on the numbers involved in any proposal, Um, consultation with employee representatives will still be crucial. It's our view that it's no different from those who are off on long-term sick or maternity, paternity or parental leave. And there is something of a myth that you cannot speak to individuals who are on leave. It's true that some might not choose to participate, but the pressure on everyone is such that many employers would be able to persuade an employment tribunal that if it came to it, they had acted reasonably in making decisions on the basis of the information that they had available. In these difficult times, it is likely that employers and employees will work together to mitigate the most difficult of circumstances for all involved. And it's our view that consultations taking place during furlough leave would be unlikely to amount to carrying out work. And, and what about annual leave? Um, what do we think that employees will be able to accrue annual leave whilst they're on furlough leave? So in terms of the work and time regulations 1998, employees are entitled to obviously 5.6 weeks of paid leave per year. This even applies, generally speaking, to those who only work part of the year, provided they em- remain employed throughout. A week's leave is calculated based on an average of pay received, which will probably include furlough leave pay. So employers will potentially still be faced with accruing obligation to provide paid annual leave at some point in the future. But does it look like employers will be able to ask their employees to take annual leave during the period that they're on furlough leave? While there may be some attraction for employers in asking employees to take annual leave during the furlough leave period, there's a question as to whether or not that might be treated as working for the employer. This is another aspect that we're currently waiting and hoping for clarification on. Yeah, that's a bit of a a running theme through all of this. Um, There is a lot of this that we're we're waiting for clarification on and hopefully that will come out soon. Um, But Really, that that takes us to the end of um, all the points that we wanted to talk uh, about today. Uh, These are um, the the main questions that we've been um, getting, um, and hopefully this has helped to provide some uh, clarity on the subject. Um, But we will be be waiting for that uh, clarification from the government about how this is all actually going to work in practice. Um, But... If anyone who's listening to this has any further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself, Gemma Forrest, Robin Turnbull, or anyone else um, in the Anderson Strathairn employment team. You can contact us at allemploymentunit at andersonstrathairn.co.uk. So thank you very much for listening. Bye. Thank you for listening to this Hey Legal podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. To hear the full CPD qualifying content, please visit heylegal.co.uk to subscribe and join our community. Or you could ask your law firm to contact us for a firm-wide subscription. Learn more, be more with Hey Legal.